Welcome to the Ascension Business Network. You are listening to the Leadership and Transformation Podcast Series. Our program is sponsored by Ascension Transformation Solutions, your business transformation technology partner. Steve Rayner will be your host for today's program. Hello, with me today is Bill Belgard. I'm Stephen Rayner, and our guest today is Dr. Miriam Lacey. Dr. Lacey is an authority in organization behavior and development. She is a full professor at Pepperdine University's Grazadillo School of Business and Management and has been at the forefront of executive development. At Pepperdine, Dr. Lacey teaches exclusively in executive programs, which include the Master of Science in Organization Development and the Presidential and Key Executive Master of Business Administration. In addition to her academic responsibilities, Dr. Lacey maintains a consulting and coaching practice where she has consulted with leaders at firms such as Exxon, Boeing, Microsoft, Warehouser, Toyota, Allergan, American Airlines, and Union Pacific Railroad. She has worked in human resources management and organization development in over 20 countries and has served on the boards of several companies in both Europe and Asia. Dr. Lacey is author of numerous articles on applied behavioral science and organization development and has served on the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award Board of Examiners. Miriam, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you with us. I um, want to begin um, talking about transformational change, large-scale change. When you think back on your career and uh, the successful change efforts that you've been involved in, and maybe the ones that weren't so successful that you've been involved in, which one stands out, and what kinds of lessons have you taken away from those experiences? I think uh, one, one would be implementing high-performance sy- systems with my colleagues, Bill Belgard and Steve Rayner, <laughs> uh, long ago in a high-tech firm. And uh, we had very good results uh, making things um, better, faster, cheaper uh, by looking at the technical system and the human system and seeking ways to increase uh, their alignment and productivity. The second one would be uh, implementing total quality management at uh, a giant wood and paper pot products company with mills and plants all over this country and through Asia as well. Um, We had one in the Middle East as well. I enjoyed that because it took a broader systems view and included uh, not only the primary functions of manufacturing and human resources, but then added in how do you get the entire system working on on on-time delivery, which seems to be a, um, what I would call it, a, a uniting thread among all the functions in an organization and getting a uh, focus on just simply making the service to your customer as well as the quality of the product, making it better, faster, and cheaper. I enjoyed that a great deal. The uniting thread idea is very interesting. Be, uh, uh, you mean because everybody had to be on time, they had to work together. Yeah, when you look at an organization, I actually don't see that many threads that go through all the functions um, for performance. I think customer satisfaction is one. And I think on-time delivery is one. And actually the best indicator of customer satisfaction is on-time delivery. (laughs) So they're (laughs) very intricately entwined there. And I enjoyed that a lot. It took me to different places in the world and um, particularly spending time in Japan, learning about their methods that Deming had implemented after World War II, which they had perfected. And um, we were just like in automobiles, making everything bigger, bigger, bigger. And the Japanese were going smaller and better quality, smaller and better quality. And, you know, at that period, they took over the market. And Cadillac was really scrambling to uh, maintain its market share or to yeah, you know, I'd say increase its quality and maintain its share. And then they came out with smaller Cadillacs to try to compete. 
Uh, I think another thing that has been uh, interesting for me was when I was the Malcolm Baldridge um, Senior Examiner Board and became a technical advisor to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That was a nice point in my career. Uh, since then, I have not been that deeply involved with total quality management systems and really devoted myself to um, executive development. In, in terms of um, when you kind of look back on, you know, these examples, you, you talked a little bit about the uniting thread and how there aren't necessarily common threads uh, in all areas. But yeah, I think they're hard to find. So hard to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what other, what other things do you think that in, in terms of observations about change that that stick out for you? Uh, what made, you know, the Tektronics example, for example, so successful or why you were able to with that wood products company change uh, and have such a huge impact on their performance? I think um, the mindset of leadership changed uh, in imagining what is possible. I know with high performance systems, they were usually satisfied with just um, gradations of improvement. And with um, social tech systems, you could get in there and really have a wallop after about two months. You didn't have to wait six, nine, 12 months to have a concrete, satisfying result. You teach at the executive programs at Pepperdine. You're working with presidents of companies. What kinds of issues do you see, you know, these executives that are they're either contemplating or involved in a large scale change? What do you see them dealing with both on a personal level and also like on an organizational level? And, and how do they need to change to effectively lead their organizations? I think one of the contributions I make is helping them see that who they are has a direct impact on the culture and performance of their organization. Who they are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. Typically when they come to me, they want to know how to fix their people. <laughs> no. They want to know how to fix the systems, fix the people. And we know that it's not always about the people. I remember, I mean, there's a classic model of plan, implement, control. And typical American managers like to plan. They throw implementation over the wall to whoever is supposed to be implementing something. And then they come back six months later and complain that not much has changed. <laughs> so I think their involvement is very important. And understanding the link between what they focus on is what they're going to get. I mean, there's an expression, uh, what, you, what is it? You get what you expect. So if they're expecting certain things, visibly, they'll get it. If they're just say it once or twice and then expect things to happen, uh, typically it doesn't happen and they just get angry and hurt, not understanding why their people are not performing. And so I try to shake them up a little bit and say, no, there's a more direct line of sight and who you are, what you think, what you do, how you interact with your people, and what you focus on uh, performance-wise. Do you help them with questions to ask, or how do you how do you uh, uh, how do you work with them and get them to change themselves? There's a there's the culture answer and the personal answer. The personal answer comes from we do some psychometric testing and. They get their own personalized reports, but we debrief it as a, a class or as a room. So if you have 15, 20 executives in there, instead of just, oh, here's your report. Let's have a one-on-one -on -one coaching section. Good luck. <laughs> we actually debrief it in the classroom and small groups and then larger groups and then finally the whole and entire class all together. And we use a particular instrument that um, I think it has five indicators at the end. And then the indicators are on a continuum. And so they're learning about themselves, but as importantly, they're learning about themselves in relation to others. Because then we put 
we we have them i have them line up from high to low scores <laughs> on a particular dimension and so that's interesting to them they look around and say who's like me who who am i different from yeah right and then we do it again on the second dimension the third dimension sometimes they don't move an inch and that is you know gives them something to think about and other times they're flying back from one end of the continuum to the other. <laughs> so there are implications for their relationships with other people and how they're perceived. And most part, it's a real eye opener because they've never done that with peers before. Right. And that's the beauty of the Pepperdine Presidential MBA is that they do this with peers. So you've got this, this line of CEOs. Up to, up, up to 15, and they're switching places based on where they, these are all the CEOs in charge of their own companies, sometimes for years, sometimes mm -hmm. family companies that have been passed down to them. even, yes. And then they have to literally physically move back and forth based on where they are in this continuum. Yeah, they're walking all over the room. Yeah. That, must be, that must be fascinating to, to facilitate and to, and to be part of. It's really, I, I think it's satisfying. It's um, a bit exciting. Uh, the energy in the room is very high because they don't always agree with it. And <laughs> it's in a way, it's good when they don't agree with it. Yeah. Because then we have a sit down and they can talk to anybody they want in the class about how do you see this as possible? I don't see myself this way at all. <laughs> and so they're for the first time in their lives, they're open to that kind of feedback. Yeah. And so that's the really the process that gets it started. Um, they take a deep step toward self-insight with that activity. And there are many others that I use as a prelude to work up to that activity. You know, so I am routinely asking them, they'll do they'll perform some task or a case in the classroom. And we look at the quality of the result of their teamwork. We look at the, the quality of their participation and discover what was it they personally did to contribute to the group success and what did they do that interfered or hindered it. So the, the, their peers have had a chance to really observe the, yeah. each other. I mean, to observe others and be observed. Yes, uh, in the in the process, and they know it. So you can, it's sort of like you can run, but you can't hide from your peers here. <laughs> That's great. And I start start off with that. What was my contribution? What was it? Uh, what did I do that hindered? I start that from day one, so that it becomes less frightening for them as they go on, and they're more and more able to do um, a self inventory. You know, I work with them on developing a critical eye, uh, the quality of their work and the quality of their interaction with people and the quality of their relationships, because no one's going to tell them. Back at their company. I support the old adage about how our executives like mushrooms. Mm. You put them in the dark and pile manure on them. <laughs> and I think the higher up you go in an organization, the more in the dark you are. And so you have to develop that self-critical eye and um, really try to look at yourself as objectively as possible. Miriam, I, I know that you know part of your philosophy around change is that the, the leader is the individual that ultimately begins to have an impact on the culture. So this, this uh, sort of self-awareness of the impact you're having is, is, so, is so very important. Could you just talk a little bit about that kind of idea about how leadership actually affects culture? In organizations? Yeah, so you have your self awareness and self insight that you have to go out of your way to find, first of all. It doesn't just pop up to you. You have to go out of your way. And particularly the more powerful you are, the more you have to bend over backwards to find that information. And often it's not even in what's said, but rather looking for what's not said, right? Because it's so difficult to get honest, uh, authentic feedback the higher up you go. So once you have that self-awareness, then you look at your management style. And we know that management style can be constant or it can be mercurial. It can be situational. 
my personal conviction is that the most powerful person in the room is the one with the broadest behavioral style. Let that sink in a bit. I mean, I think that's an important conviction that I have when I work with managers. You don't want to be the same person in every situation. You want to have the authentic you show up all the time. But behavior is not personality, right? Behavior are choices we make all the time. Do I call that guy? Don't I call that guy? Do I make a decision now? Do I wait 10 minutes or 10 days? Or do I defer it forever? All those are conscious behaviors, which are under our control strictly. So management style can also be strictly under our control. We can have um, propensities to, I really like strong affiliation with my people. So that may be my default style, but that doesn't mean I don't hold people accountable and I can't draw a tough line when it's necessary, right? So I think that leadership is an art in many ways trying to figure out how to maintain your authenticity and also give your people what they need at a time. Now that style we know then directly impacts the culture in the organization. So if your style is we have to follow the rules and we really maintain the hierarchy, well then you're gonna have a hierarchical organization and that's good for the basics about operations. When you get into marketing and want to be more creative and have more ad hoc ideas, then you shift your style that way too. You're still the same person, but what you're demonstrating is a broad behavioral repertoire that you can use to meet unique situations uniquely. Really? So a one-dimensional leader is not nearly as effective as someone who can, who can change their behavioral style to match the, the, the opportunity uh, or the situation or the, even the part of the organization or the person that they're dealing with. Yeah, I'm, I believe that's true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I like, there's a couple of different models I like uh, to use. Uh, I like the Cameron and Quinn um, values-based culture uh, where they, have, he, they use four archetypes. And I like the camera, the deal, what's it? Deal and Kennedy. Um, they have, um, well, the no, Deal and Kennedy are the four architects and Cameron and Quinn have the four quadrants, okay? But they're not one-to-one -one relationship. They're two different models. One focuses on um, the degree of feedback and how quick it is from the organization, from the environment. And the other focuses on management style and the organizational performance. So between the two of those, um, I think it gives them a pretty broad repertoire about how to look at their culture. And their capstone project for my class is a review, a description, uh, an analysis of their company culture. They have to diagnose it, they have to analyze it, and they have to create a um, a plan for the future. What do they want to adjust about their culture? Because just because the, the culture they have right now isn't necessarily the one they want to have. Especially after they've been talking to you, they realize that they realize that what they have is not exactly what they want. Well, it's interesting too because they arrive thinking they know everything they can, they know they need to know about culture, and the fact <laughs> is next to nothing. Right. And that's a big. I mean, that's the I would say the the biggest result out of my courses with them. Uh, they know what their culture is, they know what they want their culture to be, and they know how to get it. And so it's very satisfying. It's a really pleasurable part of my professional life working with these mostly men, the occasional women. I mean, having an understanding of the way you can impact culture as a leader is so critical and fundamental to uh, success. In your process, do you typically tie it to a business outcome, a specific business outcome, and then kind of work into what kind of a culture will be required to uh, achieve that, particularly if it's uh, uh, going down a direction perhaps the business hasn't gone down before and recognizing that there needs to be some kind of a shift? Well, we work on vision, what they think is possible for their organization, where they want their organization to go. 
And um, so, yeah, you look at the uh, the basic performance indicators of are you getting what you want? And if you're not, why aren't you? Is it a system problem? Is it a process problem? Is it a leadership problem? So, yes, you'd always start with the business reason to do anything. When I do team building, we have to have, we start off talking about business. You know, we got, got to see the direct relationship between the business and why we're spending time together today. Well, that's, that's really, I think that's really important. And uh, we, I think one of the largest audiences we will have will be the practitioners that are doing this kind of work, just you know, the kind of uh, person that you would have in your uh, master's of OD kind of class. Um, and even if they're not pursuing an OD degree, they would be doing that. And the notion of a lot of times you see culture being worked on separately from business. We work on the business over here. And then people are doing exercises and uh, cultural type uh, processes not connected with the business and think that they're working on the culture. I think that's uh, they're not going to get value for their time spent. There's a number of large system processes that I like quite a bit where you work on business outcomes and culture at the same time. You know, so those are worth considering. Because simply getting all the players in the room in a large hand, you know, all hands meeting or half hands or whatever, um, getting them in the room and talking about it itself is the beginning of a culture change. And then if you have them working together to make cross-functional decisions about operations and how to move forward, then you're impacting performance as well as the culture again. What you were talking about earlier about being able to make like the high performance systems to get results really quickly, you really and the, the, the work that Steve and I and, and you did together uh, back in the day is what is what essentially we all still do, which is to focus on the business outcome and then work on the culture at the same time. And that's how the results can come directly focused on the business and and comparatively quickly. Yeah, I think you can make a lot of cultural change just on the methods that you use to change the business outcomes. It's like a secondary gain instead of a primary thing you're trying to do. The method creates both changes. Right. Well, that, that's and that's a big lesson for any practitioner who wants to take this into a business and and, and work on it. Just concentrate on the business aspect uh, and tie the two together. Graham, I want to ask you about. You know, the, the, the research uh, seems to pretty consistently indicate that large scale change efforts fail to achieve the goals that are established up front or the promises that are made up front about three quarters of the time. So there's a huge you know, record of uh, large scale attempts to make a big change in organizations that fail or they fail. And it, it, at least they fail to achieve what was promised at the beginning of the of the effort. What, what do you attribute to that? What, why do you think so many of these efforts uh, are not successful? Um, one of the primary things I think is lack of personal awareness on the part of the executive. They just assume that everybody thinks like they do and that if they ask for something to happen and, and, and people will just do it because they get it. They, you know, the executive has explained it once and they figure that's enough. And it's back to the, we plan, we tell people what to do, we throw the implementation over the wall, and then we come back to find out how they're doing. And so without the constant nurturing, um, it, just, it just doesn't happen. So I think leaders have a myopic view of what is best, uh, that they know best, and they assume employees understand and will be committed to their vision without proper educating them are engaging them participatively in understanding the vision and um, implementing it. Now, I will say, I'm not a big proponent of letting people who have no strategic insight, uh, letting them create the vision, you know? And that's just, my thing, there are other consultants that disagree drastically with that. They said the vision has to be created by everybody. 
I think there are ways, uh, iterative ways to involve people in the process without handing uh, the asylum over to the inmate, so to speak. Um, <laughs> so for instance, as an example, in, uh, there's a culture instru instrument where you ask all your people what they think the culture ought to be. And you get a score back. And then you can take the instrument yourself as a leader and you can see where the differences lie. Sometimes they're lined up perfectly. Great, all systems go, let's implement the vision, we're all on board. But other times, what the people want and what the leadership team or CEO want are different. And so shall we shame the people and tell them they're wrong? I, I think there's a better way. I think we can use that as an opportunity for education, for relationship building, for bringing them along, right. Uh, right. taking them to observe things, uh, interacting or, or allowing them the opportunity to interface with customers or suppliers. You know, there is some legwork that has to be done to get these people on board. And we just telling them is not sufficient. And I think that's the mistake we make over and over. Uh, managers spend millions of dollars on training, expecting that's going to uh, fix everything. When in fact, training, unless it's like a skill, like Six Sigma, is not the answer. Education is the answer. Development is the answer. Um, teaching them about the business and why certain decisions are made. I believe those are the proper answers. So along with the myopic vision and expecting everybody else to follow it, I have found, okay, I'll supplement that by saying, managers tend to be bad at predicting and understanding what their people believe and want and do. There's a disconnect somehow there. And that's where I think a big opportunity is. I mean, I draw a bell curve uh, on a flip chart and let them know if the bell curve is normative curve. That means most of us will be on the high bump here if you just took averages out, right? We're all at the top of the bell curve. 20% on either side. Yeah. yeah. Except for individual people show up on that bell curve different places. Just like on the continuum, they were in different places. They cannot assume that their view of the world is shared by the rest of the organization, whether it's 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Right? You cannot assume the way you see the world is the way they see the world. In fact, the smart manager questions that assumption. and. It's surprisingly easy just to ask people what they think. Shocking. Managers don't want to do that. They feel like somehow they're out of control if they ask that. But it's very easy to do, and it's very easy to take a quick poll about where people at so the manager can gauge, am I like everybody else? Or do I have a big education challenge on my hand because nobody sees the world like I do? Mm -hmm. well, one of the trends in transformation now, but certainly the ones that we, one of the ones that we follow, uh, is to is to create the uh, the vision document with with uh, interviews and a great deal of input, put it, and then put it together, do it in iterations, and then the most most of the involvement by the larger organization is how do you get from here to there, from where we are now to where we need to be. They seem to be much better at doing that and being more specific about it than the leaders do. Do you you find that to be? Uh, in your experience as well? Yes. The lower, I mean, the further down the organization you go, the more concrete the world becomes. Right. The less abstract. Yeah. And that's, the, you get the, more, get the more concrete answers that way from those folks. Yeah. Are, yeah. You're right about that. But one, of the, one of the challenge questions I like to ask people uh, at large in that situation about the vision is we're on the verge of implementing this. Tell us what's wrong with it. Not how do we implement it, but tell us what's wrong with it. Well, tell us, tell us what's the matter with it. Oh, that's very yeah. interesting. Tell us what's the very matter. Powerful. Very powerful. Because yeah. if yeah. I, as a, let's say, a union person or a line manager, if I see some 
things that I just think are stupid in this vision. I think a leader really needs to get those ideas out because that's where the resistance and sabotage will come from. So tell us what's wrong with us. Why won't this work? Or what's stupid about it? Why wouldn't we want to do this? Or questions along that line, along with that, well, how would we do it? But I'd like to get the kids off the street, so to speak. I think that's an expression I learned from Master Belgard. <laughs> um, to, because otherwise we assume everybody's on board, when in fact we know they're not. They're not all on board. Well, that's that's brilliant, Miriam. Because um, the uh, you you either can ask for it, what's wrong with this, and get it that way, or as soon as they see it in their peer group, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll tell their peers what's wrong with it. This is really stupid. <laughs> Let me tell you all the all the reasons why. Yeah, that's great. And whether it's a good point or not, it needs to be addressed because those people will be powerful voices against what the leader wants to do. And you're one way or another, you have to deal with it. So better you get it up front, yeah. Get it out, get it out in the open, uh, and so uh, and so that you can uh, you can accommodate it. You can compliment it by saying, "What would be smarter? If this is stupid, what would be smarter?" And they'll come up with ideas too that no one ever thought of. I like to leave room for that. Does I mean sometimes everybody's so happy that the change is coming, they they don't have a big quarrel with it. That happens too. But when you ask me why do so many of them fail, I think it's because we don't clean up like this. Kind of following up along the same line, um, what are what are some other thoughts you have about how you can kind of combat resistance that you know is going to be there anytime you're talking about a a large scale change or prevent it. I think the, the rule of thumb for me is people do not resist things they think make sense. So if you can assume that resistance is coming from, we say, oh, people hate change. I think that's just a cop out. How do we make a compelling vision that um, improves things for people? Typically, we ask people to do you know, you do your regular job and they'll do all this implementation of the change too. That's bound to create resistance. They get resistance from home. Where are you? You're not fulfilling your mother or father duties. You know, it's all being off put to a spouse or a grandparent, or if you're lucky, hired help. But um I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is expecting people to double the work they're doing already. They were already killing themselves and we were going in the tank. And now you want them to extra kill themselves to get us out of the tank. And I think that's a serious problem that research and managers has not really properly addressed. Miriam, if you uh, were to uh, have an executive come to you and say, man, my organization needs to be transformed. There are some big issues I'm dealing with. Um, what would you say to him and her? What would kind of be your response? And how would you begin the process of getting them to begin to think about that change and how they might most effectively lead it? I guess my question would be, are you ready to walk a fire? Because it's not just your organization that has to change. You have to change and your leadership team has to change. You can't be pushing it off on everybody else in your organization. And are you really up for the challenge? Or are you pretty comfortable in your identity and who you are? And you really don't want to make many adjustments to yourself and your team. I would throw your team in there too. Because right? you may have to make some team adjustments as well. But I think it's, you know, are you fearless? What are you willing to look at? Yeah, that's great. Miriam, thank you very much. Anything to, anything to add to this conversation? This has been great. Um, I love working with executives because they're confident and smart. And... When I'm lucky, they're also really good people. Some people need to be nudged to do the right thing or nudged to be compassionate. 
I guess the long and short for me is accountability and compassion. Can you marry those two in an elegant way? If you can, you're a top leader. Well, powerful. I want to. I saw something in your in, that I really want to ask you about, and that's something new that you're working on now called Flash Consulting. Can you talk? Could you get? Oh. Can you just talk about that just for a minute before uh, before you go? I don't. I, I, I because I I uh, I just think it's a fabulous idea, but I'd like to know more about it. Oh uh, sure. Um, Flash Consulting is a process I put together uh, to do consulting in France to um, various organizations. Uh, we had some big names like Arthur Anderson and Monsanto and different things like that that were very interested in this flash consulting. And what it is, is it can be done in as brief as a month or uh, and then it gets condensed down between the first client contact and actually doing something with the client. So if you make a contact call one day, three or four weeks later, you're in the, in the client's office for an hour or two talking about the scope of their situation. And interestingly, in France, no one has problems. So they have situations <laughs> that they might like some creative ideas to get it move, moving in a fa- you know, moving faster in the proper direction. So that's what we do. We offer um, creative and innovative ideas based on uh, intensive research into best practices. So we get a topic with a manager, we research best practices, we develop recommendations as a result of the um, project scope and client meeting, and then uh, leave them with a discussion about actionable recommendations that are doable, not just pie in the sky here, spend you know, $20,000 on this when they may not want to spend $20,000 on anything, right? So we try to keep the uh, recommendations really practical, really concrete, and based on best practices. So they look at, they do library searches, internet searches, they contact people they know who are experts in the field, uh, people they know who have been doing things similar to it in organizations. And it's like a dragnet of data collection for um, a few weeks and then you put it together and um, and that's intensively done. They put the whole recommendation package together in two days, crank out a, a PowerPoint presentation with some handouts and it's a glorious, exciting, intensive, exhausting experience. <laughs> the clients love it and the students love it. So we do that a lot in our Masters of Organization Development at Pepperdine. All right. And it's taken off. The other faculty are doing it in Costa Rica, Washington, D.C., and uh, China. Well, that, that it, uh, for folks who think that, that you have to work for years with a consultant and, and millions and millions of dollars to get any, anything done, as, as some of the larger firms will portend, you can get things done. Uh, pretty pretty quickly with an opportunity like that. Now, since we've t- last talked, you also have a have a new website for to be to get a hold of. So, how would we get a hold of you to to talk about this some more? Okay, um, I think uh, I'm sure the name of my website is Miriam Lacy PhD dot com. Miriam Lacy PhD dot com. All of this will be available on the Ascension website as well. Right. And uh, thank you so much, Miriam. It's my pleasure. It was fun talking to you guys. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you have any questions or would like to speak with a transformation specialist, please contact us at info at ascensionts.com. Thanks for listening.